This meeting is being recorded by the Walton Community Access Corporation NAC channel for future telecasts. Is there anyone else in the auditorium who is recording this meeting? Please identify yourself. Uh, uh, Janie Hukele at 19 Gorham Street for 781 News on YouTube.
Assistant City Clerk Wilson behind you will be keeping the time. She will give you a signal when you have one minute remaining. Correspondence that has been submitted will be compiled by the clerk and will be included with the record. Lastly, this public input meeting is not a question and answer session. The purpose of this meeting is for the Waltham City Council to listen and hear from our community regarding the reuse of the former firm school property. I ask that everyone keep their testimony, testimony limited to that, to that matter. Thank you. Um, so at this time, um, I'd ask people that would like to testify to step up to the lectern. And to keep it moving, you can step right up. You can have to sign the law. Um, when you sign the law, um, when you sign the law, you only, before you begin to speak, um, state your name and your residential address. I ask that whoever is at the lectern, once you sign the log, just pass it behind you so that people can be signing the log so we can keep um, it. And we can test them. Sorry? Look for it. I was 
on the board of Bosch Community Development Corporation. I continue to support them financially and as a member of their advisory board. My brokerage writes a check to the Community Day Center for every house we sell. I live, eat, drink, breathe real estate. And you have to live under a rock if you don't know that there's a housing crisis, not only in Waltham, but in the whole country. So why is it that the city is moving forward with a $9.8 million budget to develop 186 acres of land that will provide only two units of affordable housing. And this is only one of the many issues I have with the current planning development department. I would um, ask the city council to stop the construction immediately and build a comprehensive master plan for the development of the entire site with community know that master planning has never really been a strong suit of the city, but I ask you to turn that around and create a strong one for the Kermel. I would ask the plan to include the acknowledgement of the Kermel's history to the preservation of as many buildings as possible, identifying potential graves that are on the property and preserving the medical and other records of the people who lived and worked there. I would also ask that this plan address one of the major issues facing the city, and that's a lack of sufficient affordable housing and a lack of resources for those who work on their own houses. There is a model that's been shown to be very effective in reducing and almost eliminating homelessness. It's called Housing First. The city of Houston, which is a little bit bigger than Baldwin, has eliminated two-thirds of its homelessness using this model. Surely we have the ability to do so. What's lacking is the will. We have the ability to change that and have all them become the model for Massachusetts. And as a data point, uh, a few years ago, Chapman's on the way did a, a survey and estimated we had about 30 adults staying in homeless shelter. <coughs> and about the same number living outdoors. Could we not find housing for 60 people? There's more than enough space on the site to provide housing for new housing, affordable rentals, and affordable ownership for many workers who work in the city, and leave plenty of room for recreational space. That's my big ask, the small ones. Um, with almost 200 acres, there should be no need to remove the short trees. It's a little thing, but I kind of like them. It takes a long time for them to grow here. I would ask you to remove the CPW city yard from the front home site. The site is zoned recreational. Nothing stuck there is not recreational use. And finally, do whatever must be done to preserve the buildings on the site. Many of them Excuse me, some of them were usable when we first purchased the site. Could be used for housing. And they've been deteriorated to the point where they must be torn down. The city deserves better than that. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Francis Joyce and I live at 49 Crown Road in Waltham. And I also own the Joe's Film of 245 inches. And I rise and I thank you, by the way, for having this meeting. I rise and I ask for your consideration uh, in uh, using at least some of the criminal land to establish another cemetery in the city. Uh, Mayor Journal Law, Chapter 114, uh, Section 10, says, quote, Each town shall provide one or more suitable places the internment of persons dying within its limits. So it's not a question of if we want to do this, it's required by state law that we have to do this somewhere at some point. And the front of the link is undeveloped in a way. Uh, so that acquisition costs very little site development costs. And the 
cemeteries that have served us, Brookville Cemetery, uh, Mount King Cemetery, Galveston Cemetery. The first reported in Maryland City was in 1703 at Brookville Cemetery, which was proud of one time at that time. But anyway, the combined land area in front of is more than Calvary, Mount King, and Brookville Cemetery combined. People think cemeteries are a waste of space. They're the best conservation land you can get. The last time that the city has established land use here in Walking for cemetery use, it was 167 years ago. So the three cemeteries we have have served us for more than 320 years. And it's a very small land area. If you look at the map of Walking, it's really less than 2% of the land area. So it's only wise to do something now while we get the land. There are other areas of trip that could be used. But this is a prime example good use of the land, conservation land in the way, and I'd ask for your consideration. I'd be happy to hold the time to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you again for doing this meeting. Thank you. Just hold for one, for one second. So uh, two things. I appreciate the, the applause and I'm sure the people do um, at the front, but to keep it moving, we can hold the applause. Um, secondly, can I ask where the clipboard is at? Great, so it's moved to the back. Great, thank you for that. And lastly, if people can just check their phones and make sure they're silent. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Diane Young. I'm on 147 Bishop's Forest Drive. And thank you for holding this meeting. I really appreciate it. Even if you just cut off my chance for applause. <laughs> you know that was not on purpose. <laughs> um, I'm here to ask. Uh, that Waltham meet its obligations to protect the CPA portion of the firm. Uh, as you may know, especially if you were on the council when we bought this property, uh, we bought two-thirds of it, from two-thirds with CPA money, uh, more than nine years ago. Uh, the purposes for that purchase were open space, uh, recreation, and historic preservation. Since then, Waltham has failed to meet its statutory requirement and obligation to place permanent restriction, uh, conservation and historic uh, restrictions on the uh, property. Uh, the city uh, administration has gone so far as to tell the Conservation Commission that the restrictions for the permit will not be placed on it until such time as the recreation plan is completed. Let me just explain how restrictions work a little bit. When you have a restriction, a permanent restriction, a restriction that has to be approved by the state, uh, there is a requirement that you find a body, um, usually a nonprofit or a state agency, that will hold that restriction. It has to have uh, a purpose that is, uh, is compatible with the uh, restriction for which they hold. So in other words, um, a large land trust could hold a conservation restriction for open space, uh, and a historic institution uh, could hold a historic preservation restriction. And the purpose of the historic or conservation restriction is to protect the qualities of the land and the buildings um, at the time that the property was acquired. That doesn't mean that you have, can't do anything. It just means you have to be sensitive to what the qualities were as you do things on the property. By waiting for more than nine years and now going to wait for who knows how many more before we put a restriction on, what we've done is we've allowed this, it allows the city to do what it wants, whereas a holder would come forward and say, hey, maybe you should put uh, this particular function or this particular field someplace where you're going to save more trees. Or maybe you should be more careful with how you're changing the topography because of the effects you're going to have on the hydrology. Or maybe you should protect this historic sliding hill. Uh, So the city, in effect, knows this is its obligation and has not done uh, anything um, other than 
permit to prepare a draft restriction, but only for the portion of the property where the field, where the uh, stream and the pond were redeveloped, the pond was restored, the stream was uh, daylighted. So there's not even a draft for the rest. There is not a single CR in place on any property bought by the city with CPA money. And even worse, there's not even drafts for the historic preservation restrictions required on a number of those properties. I think it's important to look at it as we're a, we're a city, I assume, that obeys the rules. We use the money. We ought to follow the rules and put those restrictions in place before we go ahead and um, do more to this property. At least get the holders in place so you can begin the negotiations and the discussions about what should be happening on the rest of the property. Thank you. like this ends up being a political football. It's a large site. 
It's important to the city's future. And I think people should put aside whatever their private agendas are and work for the benefit of the community. Thank you. Sure, if there's any nonprofits right now that are currently active, but I do know that over the 10 years, the meetings that have been held, I'm sure there's many people in the room that have attended all of them and been reading all the paperwork, the research, the documents, and showing how much energy and time people have put into carefully respecting this property. Nothing has been done quick out of respect. Together we stand as a community to listen and provide input as we come to use of the land. City Council and the Mayor will be listening and the input over 10 years plus tonight has got to come to head. And we stand before the entire Commonwealth and show them what we can do as a community. And I thank you for listening. Good evening, my name is Megan Keneally, and as some of you might know, this is not really my kind of environment. Um, I live at 12 Briarwood Road. Uh, my family and I have lived across the street from the Fernald since 1972. Um, I grew up on Chapella Road, and I was fortunate enough to purchase a house on Briarwood. You can see the Fernald from where we live. Um, I'm in favor, I'm just here to say I'm in favor of the current plan. Um, that is on the city's website that anybody can go and look at. Um, this transparency, this whole process has been transparent. Um, as a kid growing up, we sledded up there, we played softball in the fields, basketball. Um, my children and I both volunteered for many of the, um, the, the women's shelter that was there, the um, hospital that was there. We have friends and family who've worked there throughout the years, and I think that this plan is, is good for the neighborhood, and I think it's a, it's a good way to go forward. That's it, thank you. My name is Susan Rose, and I'm also on Briarwood Road, I'm at 80 Briarwood Road, and I just have a couple of um, questions uh, to keep in mind. Um, big concern is the uh, area of excavation along Trapello Road that I've heard is a designated wetland. And there's already existing flooding that we're well aware of at Shirley Road and Upton Road. And uh, just as a parallel example, when the, um, with the construction of the new high school, um, I've heard from any number of people who live in that area that the excavation created conditions for many residents of um, basement flooding that they never experienced before. And what they had uh, shared with me is that at that time, the city had offered them uh, sump pumps, sometimes multiple sump pumps, to these residents to help with their new founded flooding in their basements. And I'm wondering, um, because of the uh, potential problem with um, affected hydrology, 
is the city um, ready to step in with remediation for additional residents who may experience flooding problems as a result of this um, construction on wetlands? And wouldn't it be more efficient to recognize that there's a problem and not to disturb the existing wetlands? The um, second uh, observation is something that just hit my awareness recently, that there's um, unmarked graves on the thermal property, and there's a high likelihood that excavation and constructive will find human remains. Um, there had been a suggestion to use ground penetrating radar to locate human remains on the property so that there can be respectful burial for them. As far as I know, this hasn't happened, so this is just a cautionary suggestion. And we all know that the issue of human remains, remains was not a good look for Harvard. So why would Waltham want to be vulnerable to public scrutiny and a public relations nightmare? And we have had enough um, negative press on the um, residents' medical records uh, that were not confidentially cared for. And a nightmare of excavation revealing human remains is unfortunately quite likely and entirely avoidable with the use of ground penetrating radar. Um, and just the third one is um, just having to do with um, excavating on natural habitats and changing the topography mostly, most clearly on Owl Hill, um, the sledding area there. And um, just came to mind that um, Joni Mitchell's lyrics of paved paradise and put up a parking lot were intended to be a cautionary note rather than a how-to manual. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Marie Jaley. I live at Ken Porter Road in Waltham, Ward 3, Precinct 2. Um, it's across the street from the firm. Um, and you may recognize me um, in, from other city affairs. I recuse myself, I have recused myself, and will continue to recuse myself regarding matters on the Historical Commission. I'm speaking here tonight as a resident from across the street. I grew up um, across the street. We used to play there. Um, we used to go to the movies. We knew the state boys. My brothers played baseball with them. We used to skate there. And uh, we used to go to church there as well. Um, what I'd like to see happen is a master plan be shown to the public, if there is a master plan. Um, and I'd like a more transparent process. Um, apparently, there have been changes to the plan that's been posted on the city website. Um, and so, but there's no been an update to that. So I'd, I'd like to see a transparent uh, as to what, and also the process of what's happening so that we're warned about the construction that's going on and what that's all about. I used to be on the Met State Reuse Committee, um, and uh, I also wrote the history of the firm that's on the city's website. So, um, and the, the Met State actually turned out to be pretty good, and I'd love to see something similar happen with the firm. Um, I would like to see a less intensive, and uh, also for the city, a less expensive, uh, plan for the recreational area of the, um, the property. Um, and to have it more passive recreation rather than have all that active recreation, which will take a lot of maintenance and um, personnel. Um, and I would also like to have a respectful consideration for the former residents at the firm. Um, it is the oldest it had been the oldest institution for people with intellectual disabilities in the Western Hemisphere. And we should not let that be forgotten. Um, and there should be a museum on the site dedicated um, to the, uh, the history of that site and the people who had lived there. We, I lived there in what would be considered the bad old days. So I knew what was going on. Well, we didn't know which kids exactly the nature of what was going on, but we knew that people were being essentially incarcerated there. And I also studied 
the 1918 flu epidemic in Waltham. And what I found was that what happened at the frontal was an absolute tragedy. The death rate was 50% in some of the buildings. Um, and I might add that I also researched their death records and they were all buried elsewhere at Calvary and at Mount Creek. Um, so I'm here to tell you that it was, there aren't bodies buried there. Um, there is no cemetery there. Uh, the records show, and none of the annual reports, which I've also been through, mention any burials on the site. Um, and the death records themselves show that the people who died were buried elsewhere. So, um, and that's it. Thank you. I thought people were not supposed to be a problem. May I ask the doctor? Oh, why didn't you? Just me. So, the church was. And I'm going to speak, but I think it's really rude. Um, anyway, my name is Bill Morton, and I live at 81 Briarwood Road. I've uh, lived there for over 25 years, and I want to echo the sentiments of um, uh, my neighbor who spoke earlier, uh, Megan. Uh, I think that the uh, City Council should be applauded for their work. This has been going on for over 10 years. Um, as a neighbor, myself, of the Fernal, there's been, I've been wondering for a long time what's gonna happen and hearing various things. And I think the plan that you put through is a good, solid plan. Um, as a matter of fact, my um, fiance uh, is uh, originally from Acton, and they have a very good working model there of something that is a similar site. And um, we actually, we still have friends that live there, and we go there for Fourth of July celebrations, and I just think it's a, um, it's a wonderful asset for the city of Waltham to have a public space that can be used for recreation. Uh, I've heard they're thinking of having Special Olympics uh, there. Um, and as a neighbor, you know, no matter what goes in there, it's going to impact us somehow. And, you know, I've, had, I've thought about this often. You know, if, 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 if traffic is impacted by people uh, attending a concert or recreating, I can put up with that, okay? Because people are doing something enjoyable and something meaningful. Um, and it's not day-to-day, -day, it's not a day-to-day -day traffic jam that this is going to create. There's been a lot of talk about various things on the site, and I think it's time to figure out and, you know, tweak this a little if you want. Let's move forward with this, because this is going to be a huge asset for the city of Waltham. Hello, um, my name is Tom Benavides. I live at 308 River Street, Unit 3, and thank you for holding this public input session. I'll spend my time talk, uh, discussing the buildings on the Fernal property, because this, while the city is moving forward with plans for recreational amenities across the open space of 190 Chapella Road, those plans don't address the commitments the city made when it bought the property in 2014. The Fernal, as America's first institution for the development to be disabled, has an incredible amount of complex history surrounding it that Waltham has a moral obligation to memorialize, and Waltham also, I think, has a legal obligation to make sure that the buildings are preserved. And so far, Waltham has not abided by these commitments. I know of no firm plans for a disability memorial or museum, and it is startling how rapidly and drastically the buildings have deteriorated over the past 10 years due to abandonment and vandalism. Waltham needed a reuse plan for these buildings 10 years ago, but in lieu of that, Waltham definitely needs a reuse plan for every single one of the fertile buildings now. I am very happy to see that the city has so far made plans for seven of these buildings, one which is being rehabbed by the city for housing, five of which which will be leased for housing development, and one of which will be leased for an adult daycare. I am in full support of these plans, and I come to you today with an additional two requests. First, please put in the work necessary to get these existing plans across the finish line. There are so many barriers to these projects completion, from restrictively short lease periods to incredibly steep financial costs for historical restoration and the installation of utilities. City actions, such as modifying the leases if they go unfilled and committing city or CPA funds to these developments, could go a long way to making the preservation of these buildings and construction of new housing more feasible. And second, 
please make sure every single building on the property has a reuse plan for them to be reserved. I'm happy that we have plans for seven of them right now, but there are a lot more than seven buildings on this property. All of them need reuse plans. 10 years of falling into disrepair is already 10 years too long. We need the city to act quickly to repurpose all of these buildings, both as historic museums and memorials to Infernal's past, and also as desperately needed housing, because we are in a drastic housing crisis. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dan Sari, and I live at 40 Drop Layout. Um, I, I just would like to say how disappointing it is to see the way that this property has been managed by the city. The deterioration of the buildings and the haphazard way that this thing is being parceled out to various uses without a unified plan just seems like such a wasted opportunity. There are people who specialize in doing public outreach and creating master plans for these big properties that need to be reused. And the fact that the city parceled this out to different departments and said, just go with it. I, I think that the disappointment with the recreation department's plan just shows just how unprepared these people are to handle a task of this magnitude. And the results speak for themselves. I, I live right across the street from the area. It's going to be an incredibly painful, tacky looking site that it seems like it's trying to paper over something that was meant to be a really great thing, but ended up being a really horrifying thing for a lot of people. And to take a little train that goes around in a circle that literally no one asked for and just plop that down right in front of it. Like, <laughs> we have no idea who has been putting input into this monument that they're putting in to memorialize this place. The only thing I can find out about them is that they're apparently the people who thought the fernal was great and we should keep it open. And I just honestly don't think that if you ask the residents, by and large, that would be how they thought of it. And I really hope you have seen these plans for memorialization and are confident in what they are going to contain and putting your name behind that. Because it's going to be there for people to see, and your names are going to be attached to it. I, I would like to see the Fernald's property be designed thoroughly in a comprehensive way. Right now, there's an assumption that you're driving there. Why is there no bus plan? There's no bus stop anywhere for these facilities. You have to have a car, you have to have someone drive you there in order to get to this park. We have the only, like, you know, all accessible playground in the city. I live in the area, trust me, not one of the sidewalks that leads to it is navigable on a wheelchair. Like, There, this seems like something that is being rushed through to preserve someone's legacy. I have been at the input meetings. The December 21st meeting, I took notes. Overwhelming opposition to this place being developed into a recreational facility without first memorialization. People wanted to see walking space and trails and signage. That was by and large consensus. And then a museum and they wanted to see something productive done with the buildings, something that would actually help the dis disabled community as opposed to just flinging them off to the different departments. We should do better with this. This is an opportunity. Right now, I know that the city is struggling with its commitments to, to uh, the um, you know, MBTA Act, and I know this place wouldn't satisfy those commitments, but I've heard a lot of you are really concerned about affordable housing. This is your opportunity to make that happen. And as a neighbor, I would love to have more neighbors. I would love to see more children playing on those playgrounds instead of getting driven there. As it stands, there is one sidewalk there. You press that button on that crosswalk, you better make sure there's no cars in sight because, and you're gonna be there a long time. They do not stop. Children are gonna get creamed crossing that street who live near door, next door. This is just incredibly disappointing, and it's going to be your legacy.
Good evening, councillors, and thank you so much for holding this hearing. My name is Nina Hudwin, and I reside at 80 Jennings Road. The notes that I prepared for you tonight to speak about were about the unmarked graves on the site and my fear, which has already been spoken about, that there are graves there that we know nothing about and that at the moment there is some bulldozing going on the, on, on the site without any regard for doing any ground penetration radar or any sonar investigation first. I find that really shocking. And going on the back of what Dan just said, even the even if the city believes there are no graves there, as your legacy as the council, wouldn't we want to verify that before disturbing the earth and disturbing any potential final resting places and human remains? So that was what I had prepared to say. I now want to just expand on that a little bit because that had already been covered and talk about the lack of a master plan. I hear very clearly that the supporters are saying that there is a plan in place and there has been a plan and there has been community input for many, many years. We've been, uh, had no community input meeting to my knowledge since the end of 2020 or 2021. Thousands of people have moved into Waltham since then. We're in 2024. This meeting tonight is the first meeting that has been held since that time and has been held because we have put pressure on the councillors to do this. I think that it is imperative that these meetings continue for another several months so that there are more opportunities for neighbours and for Waltham citizens to come here and say what they feel about this particular site. One meeting is insufficient. I wish and I hope that you will stop work immediately, that the plan that is currently on the Waltham website is thoroughly updated and that transparency becomes the name of the game. We cannot continue to hide what's happening on the phone from the citizens of Waltham. I ask you please to take that into account and to stop work now, to look at the problem that's going on with the wetlands and to have some thorough and full input from both citizens and from consultants who can help come bring together a master plan that really speaks to the full usage of the site. Just an idea. Marie Daly said it right. This was the, the, uh, the, the Western Hemisphere's uh, education site that was held up as a master uh, plan for back when, in its day. Let the funnel be a place where education can continue in a good way. What about putting up something like a, uh, a center for higher education where, where educational facilities within the state can come and use those facilities for conferences and seminars? I think that would be a great use of that site. I'm going to stop now and let somebody else have a turn, but thank you for your, your attention. Bringing up a lot of time here. Back in 2022, Walter sought and heard um, tree city recognition. Now we're going to cut down old growth oak trees and a beautiful century plus old tulip tree. Does anyone see the irony here? I think it would be nice if we could create an environmentally sensible arboretum which incorporates these trees with walking paths for everybody to enjoy that area. Don't tear those trees down. I know people are thinking about, okay, we'll plant new trees. Just really cutting little baby trees. These are century old trees that not only are they beautiful to look at, they're great for the environment. Let's just think about that, please. Thank you for your time. I'm Allegra Atkinson. I live at Five Whittier Ave, and I have Addison Porter, who also lives at Five Whittier Ave. And we are here um, to speak on sort of the same points that we've heard in terms of a master plan needing to be put into place, um, transparency around what the historical preservation is going to look like, specifics around that. 
Um, I'm an educator in, in public schools, and one of the things we pride ourselves on is inclusion of students who have special needs. Um, I witnessed coworkers this morning working in a safe way with a student who needed to be restrained, and the student was upset, and in order for the student to be safely calmed and put into a place that they could, you know, move through the rest of their day and be educated, um, there were no less than six adults. Close, far, blocking exits so that other students didn't come through. It takes patience, it takes so much complex thinking, on the spot thinking, education. Special education is an incredibly important part of our world and our community. Our diversity makes us stronger. This is a place where those complex things were being worked out. It wasn't done well. It, it wasn't always great, but to not recognize that this complexity exists and just try to pave over it, literally, um, is just really not honoring the daily work that so many brilliant educators do every single day in Waltham and across this country. So for us to, again, move on more morally from what happened here without preserving that history is, is in my opinion, morally wrong. Um, I don't know if Addy, are you ready to say what? So when I talked to Addy about why I was coming tonight, um, it took me about five minutes to sort of explain because we've had conversations about schools where not good things happened. Um, we've talked about native schools where children were harmed and taken away from their families. And so building on that foundation, I spoke about the Fermal School and how kids were harmed at this school. And her words were, I, I don't want to go on a train around a place where kids were hurt. I want to learn about them. I want to honor them. Um, so again, she's here with me to bring those words and bring that sentiment. Um, we are Waltham residents. We plan to be in the open recreation spaces that are provided that are beautiful. We're so thankful for all of the parks that we have here. We got to do this right. I don't want to bring my kid to a place that isn't done right. So please, please, um, pause the plan, get a master plan. We can do this. I don't actually live in Waltham, but um, I hope you'll still hear me out. I live at 64 Parker Avenue in Somerville, Massachusetts. Um, hello, my name is Liam, and uh, I'm deeply concerned about the current plans for Fernald. Just, I, I need to stop you, just what's your last name? Uh, Liam Gretzky Jewel. My primary concern lies with the absence of a solid plan for the future of the buildings themselves. With few exceptions, it would seem that the city is complacent on continuing to drag their feet, letting the remaining buildings further deteriorate. Back in 2014, when Waltham bought the land largely using CPA money, there was an understanding that the city would commit to the historical preservation and reuse of the buildings, and hire a security company to thoroughly secure the property. Neither of these things have happened, and as a result, Many buildings that were once in easily salvageable condition have seen significant decay. There were still a number of buildings on the property which could, which could conceivably be reused. The city should promptly secure these structures and take steps towards their rehabilitation. However, it appears that many of them, including a number of structures on Eastern Campus, such as Schoolhouse, will be left to rot. In addition, the city recently left the fates of six buildings up to private developers by putting them up for lease. Whether any developers will actually be willing to restore these structures remains up in the air, especially given their lack of utilities available to service the buildings. Neither of these are good options if the city intends to maximize the reuse potential of these buildings, but as we've observed over the last decade, this was never a priority. I'm aware that many roadblocks exist which make redevelopment challenging, including a lack of compliance with CPA restrictions, zoning complications, funding, and more. But beyond these, saving the salvageable buildings will require a genuine dedication from those in power to preserve these structures of immense historical and architectural value. Unfortunately, based on the current plan, this doesn't appear to be the case. With that said, I hope the city will make the preservation of these buildings an urgent matter. 
Failing to do so would be an act of disgrace towards this important artifact in America's troubled history of institutionalization. Thank you, and thank you for holding this meeting, um, though. I think it was, uh, it should have happened a lot sooner. Hello. My name is Brian Parsifal, I live at 144 Moody Street, and I was hired to do the original photographic recordation of the front of the property. So I think I have a fairly unique perspective on the conditions on the ground from the time Waltham purchased the property up until today. When Waltham purchased the property, uh, 73 buildings, about nine of them, nine of the residential buildings could have been immediately reused as housing with some moderate cleanup for sure. But there was an opportunity for eight to nine buildings to be reused as housing. There was also a fully functional hospital um, after Waltham purchased the property, the power was cut, uh, water turned off, pipes burst, vandals ensued, uh, aggressive neglect began. None of those original residential buildings, save one, North Hall, can be easily repurposed at this point. The building's up for lease, uh, and, and I think the ideas behind that are really great. You know, they should have been used for housing all along, but it's going to require gutting those structures at this point. So there was a missed opportunity, you know, about nine years ago when we bought the property. We can't do anything about that now. Um, but I am glad to hear that there is some effort to, to think about housing with some of these residential structures. It's been mentioned that this is one of the oldest, the oldest developmental center of its kind in the Western Hemisphere. It's also one of the most significant. So I'd like to offer a little bit of historical perspective. Walter Fernald, Problematic as he may have been in taking people from the community to house them, warehouse them, nevertheless figured out how to teach them. Special education in this country, in this hemisphere, began in Waltham, Massachusetts, three miles down the road. The schoolhouse that Liam mentioned, this is the most historic schoolhouse in this country. This is where special education began. So that building can be saved. That building, when Walton bought it, was in much better shape. It's going to need an enormous amount of work, but it is salvageable. I would like to draw attention to three other structures near the schoolhouse, the two original children's dormitories, the boys' dorm and the girls' dorm. The boys' dorm was the first residential structure built um, as kids were being trucked up from Boston to work in the farm, you know, dig up the field stones, which laid the foundations. The, the boys' dorm was the first one built, designed by William Preston, who designed the Boston Public Library, by the way, along with some of the other buildings on the Fernwood campus, designed an aspirational building. There is nothing like the boys' dorm in any other state institution anywhere in this country. It is an aspirational building. When Walter Fernwood took over as superintendent, he realized how unrealistic that building was. <laughs> so uh, Walter Fernald had a big hand with William Preston in designing the girls' dormitory called Chipman Hall. This became innovative and also inspired the design for not only every other residence on the Fernald campus, but residential buildings in other state institutions across Massachusetts, across the country, even into the United States military. So here we have, just a few miles from here, the most historic schoolhouse in the country, and we've got two historic dormitories of architectural significance and historic significance. Now, the boys and, dorm, the boys and girls dorms cannot be saved. They're, they're in a terrible state of collapse. But you could save a chunk of them. You know, you, I've seen this done before in a, in a very tasteful and safe way. And the interesting thing about the school and the two dorms, plus the original uh, administration building, uh, Wayward Hall, also in a, a state of collapse, they all surround a natural courtyard with sidewalks, accessibility, um, and 150-year-old trees. So I would propose that we save the schoolhouse and gymnasium, maybe not just with city funding, maybe we can try to find some other support outside the city, save that building, repurpose it as a museum, restore its status as a center for special education, and save a chunk of the boys and girls dorm, a chunk of Waverly Hall, and build a beautiful park 
around the historic courtyard. Thank you.
So let's be better. Hi, I'm Andrew Horton Hall. I live at 30 Marlboro Road, and we have a big window that overlooks Owl Hill at the Glenwood Center. Uh, we've lived at our place for about nine years now, and over that time, we've seen a lot of phases happen throughout this rental process. There was the overgrownness of the property, there was the uh, vandals with spray cans parking in our house, walking across, breaking things. We're living in the least grown phase of this project now, and now the bulldozing and demolition of something that we really hold dear, which is a, a sliding hill called Owl Hill. Um, a few years ago, when the mayor was running for the great re election, she invited my family personally to go sledding at Owl Hill, and we love it. You know, it's one of the things that actually gets my son out of the house and from video games, which is really important you know, to get some fresh air. And over the years, you know, the neighborhood kids are into it too, you know, and all, all of a sudden we have this community of sledders. And we really enjoy sledding there until a few weeks ago where the chain link fence slid up and the bulldozers came and had left nothing but destruction and a mess. And, you know, it's been hard to explain to my son, who's seven years old, that his favorite sliding hill in Walpink, the one reason that he gets out most days, is being bulldozed. And without much of an explanation why, other than for a choo-choo train that no one's going to be using, that no one really asks for, no one really cares about. So I urge you, and you know, I've been in email contact with many of you over the years about Pernal, but I urge you to really consider the open space of this property. You know, we have successes here in the city of Mackerel Hill, we have successes with uh, Beaver Brooks Reservation, which is incredible to walk in. And you know, I would urge the city council to do the same for you know, much as property in front of it. Um, you know, it's, it, it's hard to see something that you know, we enjoy so much being taken away so suddenly and seeing the mayor's petition be revoked in such a dramatic fashion. So, Again, I'd urge you to reconsider and you know, ask, you know, maybe create a community steering committee where you know neighborhood kids and neighborhood people who live within this neighborhood have say and have input of what happens here. You know, we have a lot of splash pads in this city. We have a lot of recreation in this city. We pride ourselves in recreation, but you know, at some points, you know, there's going to be too many splash pads. There's going to be too many mini putts. You know, we have mini putt at Prospect Hill that no one uses. Why do we need mini putt here? So. I'd ask you to reconsider and to really solicit the input of our community. Thank you. Hi. She is who we all talk about. She seems to be the person in charge running everything. I have been to city council meetings. It looks like for most of you, Everything she wants gets rubber stamped. And I have no problem with her. I've met her a number of times. I really like her on a personal level. Um, she's not qualified to make <laughs> these decisions um, by herself without input. We live in Massachusetts. We live in Waltham, Massachusetts. Some of the greatest minds in the country live here. And I looked up the firm who did the plan for the recreation center. And it's called Nezra, I believe. It's an engineering firm. Where are the landscape architects? Where are the you know environmental designers? What it looks like it's a one-man operation, and they've done you know playgrounds for us before, but this isn't a playground. This is a historic, important property. And there's been, like everyone has said, I will echo it again, no transparency, no master plan. It's just, it's alarming, it's upsetting as a citizen. And I am trying, I am trying to get involved. I am going to meetings. And I, I don't know, I'm just like banging on the door. I don't know what to do. I feel totally powerless as a citizen. And that is an awful feeling. Um, I'm really happy to see so many people here today. 
Uh, I'm disappointed to not see the mayor. I hope she's watching from home. Uh, and um, one last thing, there is an abutter who I was in contact with who couldn't be here tonight because she's sick. She abuts, she lives on Chappelle Road. Her name is Courtney Applegate. And she was away for two weeks and came home to see bulldozers in her backyard, tearing down all the trees on the property line and telling her that they were tearing down her fence and putting up a new one, her fence that she owns. And no one from the city has been in contact with her. Uh, it's just, it's a mess. <laughs> all right, like something has to happen. Something has to change. I want to see my city councilors get involved, be active, and try to get something done. I just, it is, um, I'm looking up what she wrote, but I don't know, I'm worked up now, so, and I'm gonna let other people, <laughs> other people talk. So, thank you for hearing me out. Thank you for finally having this meeting. And again, I hope it leads to change. My name is Carlson Carter, I live in the 74 South Street, Waltham. I'm, I'm here to support the mayor's plan and the city council's plan for the Fernal, uh, which is the result of 20 years of listening and obtaining input from a wide network of interested parties. The city recognizes the history of the Fernal, most notably the, the horrific abuse that victimized the developmentally disabled decades ago when under the, under the authority of the state. The city of Waltham had no culpability in anything that happened there. Now this, this land belongs to the city of Waltham and it should be used for the enjoyment of the city of Waltham. Mayor McCarthy, with the, with the support of the city council, is continuing to expand our enviable family-oriented recreational areas to all parts of the city. And by developing the Fernal into a multi-purpose, universal, handicapped playground, it has been mocked, and we can hear that tonight too, uh, as an amusement park, when it's not an amusement park at all, um, with a choo-choo train. Uh, I hate to differ with, you know, with one of the other speakers, but I can't wait to take my grandchildren to a, a place with a train. Children love trains. If you go to Disney World, there's a train that goes around. I remember Norm Baker Park when I was a kid, they had a train that goes around. Many, many parks and recreational areas. This, this area should be used for the enjoyment of the people of Waltham here, that, that, that live here now. Uh, they talk about you know people getting involved in families. Um, I see families at playgrounds all the time because I take my grandchildren to, to all of the, the beautiful playgrounds that we have in this city. Those people are too involved with their daily lives. They can't be organizing constantly, uh, you know, looking for, that's why they elect representatives. They, 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 they entrust you people and the mayor with doing what they want to see done in the city. And I dare say that, that I think the people of the city love the recreational facilities and the beautiful playgrounds. We are the envy of all the communities uh, around us. Uh, also, what is being proposed is much needed veterans housing, complete with a service area. Those who are opposed to this city's plan are doing so for purely political purposes. And I'm going to get to that. Uh, I read social media, maybe all of you don't, but I see what's being said about it, and it's all about politics. These are the people that lost the last election, and they're looking for issues to campaign on. They are focused on vilifying you, the mayor. Just, I, I would have been disappointed if they really didn't vote Yeah, okay. They, they've distorted the truth, and created such animosity that nothing they say will be listened to. And enabling them to keep, it enables them to keep false, divisive issues in the public arena until the next municipal election. These, these are some of the things that have been said. Not, not tonight, because I think they're being very careful what they're saying. They quote, Mayor McCarthy and her circle, end of quote, have been accused of 
The quote again, and these, these, are, these are well known people in the city. Old fashioned ideas about disability and a very negative view of social justice activists and are being connected to people who are heavily in, interested in, in remembering Fernald as a positive place. Now, do you, have you seen any indication that, 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 that these city officials are being, uh, they're, they're, they're remembering Fernald as a positive place? I've never heard anything positive about it. She has been accused of, quote, viciously trying to wipe out the history of Fernald. Imagine that. I, have you had any indication that Mayor McCarthy has, has viciously to wipe out the history of Fernald? Yeah. Nothing could be further from the truth. Jeanette McCarthy has dedicated her life to every person, but especially children in this city, and to portray her as this uncaring, indifferent person to the developing disabled is, is a detestable lie. I find this constant impugning of the council and the mayor's integrity and characters, characteristics with repeated insinuation that you are engaging in backroom illegal deals to be repugnant. Going forward, give these political critics their forum and some of us will turn over the rocks and expose their true agenda. Fernal in the news 
than the way it has been in very recently. We need to find a way to move forward together. Again, what is the vision for the entire site? Share it with the public so we can grease the wheels, please. I want to move forward together instead of in opposition. Thank you. My name is Eric Scribner. I live at 29 Shirley Road. Uh, I've been a neighbor of for 30 years, and uh, I've also worked with it. And uh, some of the folks that have lived there, as well as some of the folks that work there. And they also have over 30 years' experience in human services, primarily in disability. So, as a neighbor, I'm looking forward to getting the sun pump from whoever is going to get into us because of the unusual landscaping that is affecting some of the wetlands that it's adjacent to. Um, and I know we are called the water city, and maybe that's not just a noun, but it should be a verb. We are watching the watch city to make sure that the lives of the people that live and work there are respected. I haven't heard anyone here yet, and I'm not going to speak for it, the disability community that by and large have the most influence or should have the most influence on how this place is remembered and to some extent how it is used. I'm not going to reiterate that. I'm not going to reiterate that. I'm going to one slice of thing that I did not hear about is that regardless of what happens there, what is going, any kind of reconstruction, rehabilitation, landscaping, or continued need for employment, human beings to do things on the grounds there. The disability community should be part of that. There are umpteen, umpteen nonprofits in this area that I personally have worked with. I have not heard anything from them directly that any outreach has happened to include that on an ongoing basis, or to reach out to the people they serve that are still alive, that live there, live different, to ask them, what are your experiences? What would you like to see here? What would make, it, what would make you happy? What would make you feel that you were remembered? What would make you feel that it's acknowledged some good things and some bad things happen there? I've not heard anything about that. That would be a wise thing to do. So we're all watching. Hello, I'm Sean Diamond. I live at Three Marlton Road in Waltham. Uh, and as of earlier this morning, I believe I'm the only independent candidate for state rep in Middlesex 9th District. I do want to thank all the counselors that had the bravery to vote to have this public hearing. Um, I understand there were some counselors that don't, and I understand that from the comments in the audience today, there's some folks that want to just see the existing plans as they are, move forward as quickly as possible. I want to make sure that people, that we know that people don't just want to be, be heard, they want to be listened to. They want to have their questions answered. They need to have their questions answered. People want a sense of control over their lives, especially where they live and where their children live. We elect a mayor to get things done, and that's true. But we elect a city council to get things done the right way. People want a transparent collaborative process that's come up almost a dozen times from different speakers. People need ongoing engagement and open communication insights about what's happening and why before it happens. Options that fit their needs. They shouldn't have to piece it together on social media and through neighborhood gossip. Waltham deserves better. Waltham deserves a comprehensive plan for Fox Fernald and beyond. Fernald's history requires preservation and introspection. We have to ask ourselves, will Waltham be the city that started education, or start, started special education, or will be, we be the city that abandoned that legacy and neglected the property? So far, we're on track for the latter. 
The question tonight is, will we make Fernald a better place than it was before? Will we make Waltham accessible to all? Will we honor the spirit of conservation or create an open public dumping ground that's slightly hidden from you? Again, so far we're on track for some of these things. The previous speaker mentioned special education and special needs students. My understanding is that just outside of the city borders, there's a school called the Cotting School. It is a special needs school that has folks from many towns and municipalities in the area that attend. They could be potentially some of the folks that attend and use some of the facilities that were identified here tonight as possible opportunities. I ask that after tonight that the council act as a check on the mayor where it's appropriate and move expedition, expeditiously where it's appropriate. But share updates about plans and meetings before they happen. At least as of this past weekend, this meeting itself wasn't even on the city website. I had to find out about it on social media. And then I posted it on other social media to help folks find out about it. I'm sure other neighbors and other people had to talk to each other to even find out this meeting was going on. We do need to ensure rapid progress to secure and preserve the buildings. I understand that they, we bought the property in 2015. It's almost 2025. We need preservation of those buildings before 2025. And I stuttered a little bit there, so I said 2025, not 2035. Not another 10 years. It sounds like there is some questions about whether or not there's unmarked graves or human remains and other things like that. So again, as another, many folks have said, I would ask that we require the due diligence that's appropriate given the uncertainty. I would also ask that we have a complete and open public process before any irreversible changes like the destruction of a sledding hill that apparently is very cherished in this city. And I also ask, as I think this is maybe the first unique thing that I've said because I've been doing a lot of listening and keeping track of what other folks have said, I ask that as soon as possible and practical that the fences and the no trespassing signs come down and we replace that with a spirit of allowing law-abiding citizens to openly travel through the safe parts of the property to do some community self-regulation, to identify what's going on in parts of the property that aren't visible from Waverly Oaks Road or Capello Road, and that we get an appropriate security force to secure the buildings that are falling apart and crumbling, not only from vandalism, but God forbid somebody actually goes into one of those buildings and gets hurt. So with that, thank you very much.
feel as others do, that in the memory of those that so abused them, to have a place for those that aren't as fortunate as us, um, to respect the environment, to um, have good causes for this place that's been such a difficult place with a difficult history. And it's beautiful beautiful area with beautiful trees, beautiful grounds that even driving by, you, you used to be able to appreciate. Now it's horrible, just horrible. And just a real question and plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. 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 Thank
um, um, check what you write, and they won't put in things that they don't believe are right. So we need to have the transparency, uh, and I, I believe everybody else has said pretty much what I said, but um, I heard firsthand from my, my mother-in-law about how bad it was there. And I, I, don't, for my, I would not take a train around there. I would not bring my kid to show, show a kid how bad it was there. So thank you very much. My name is Katie Pappenau Fuxi. I live on 11th Chase Road. Um, many of my points have already been covered far more eloquently than I could do by other people tonight. Um, but I wanted to emphasize just a couple through a public health lens. I'm currently in school with a nurse practitioner, and I work with patients who are louder, please. Sorry. I've worked with patients who are homeless or have difficulty maintaining housing. And it's heartbreaking. And we could fix that. We could fix that and still preserve green spaces. And preserving green spaces is also important for public health and reduces the incidence of heat-related illnesses. It reduces asthma exacerbations for people who have chronic diseases like COPD. It, it, makes it easier for them to breathe, to have green spaces that save the heat instead of asphalt that reflects it back. Um, the last plans that I saw included a accessible uh, playground and a regular playground. The great thing about accessibility is that it's accessible to everyone. People who can People who can walk upstairs can also walk up a ramp that somebody who's in a wheelchair can also get up. It makes it easier for everyone to live and learn and play together. Um, I, we've lived here in Waltham for about 10 years and on Chase Road for about seven and had this usually wonderful view of Fernald and all of its green spaces. I've loved living here. I think that we can revitalize Fernald in a way that's respectful and sustainable and beautiful, I really believe that we can do that. I don't want the way that we revitalize Fernald to make me embarrassed to live here. Thank you for your time. My name is Diana Patton Lopsi. I also live at 11 Chase Road. Um, and I've also been a resident of Waltham for over 10 years now. Um, during those 10 years, I've spent a lot of time, as I think a lot of folks here have, going down the rabbit hole of trying to answer the question, what is happening at Fernald? A lot of people have mentioned making things more open, being more clear about what's going on, and also making sure that when there's time for public input, that input is heard, and if at all possible, implement it. Everybody has lots of different ideas for what to do with this incredible space that we have. There are a lot that I've come across over the many years that we've been talking about what to do with this area that have made me really excited. Affordable housing, walking trails, wetland restoration, preserving the historic buildings, making it into a space where people can learn about our history and learn from our history. So I was really disappointed to see suddenly everything moving forward at a much faster pace toward the one aspect of any plan that I've seen that does none of that at all. Um, there were a lot of great plans for weapon remediation. I want to know what happened to those. Um, why are we destroying existing habitats old growth trees, as people have mentioned, instead of using the areas that could already be developed on? And why are we covering over green spaces and our history with parking spaces? These aren't really the things that our community desperately needs. And it is baffling to see that that's become the priority. There are a lot of incredible things that we could do with this space. Um, but I don't want to see this current plan go forward until we make 
some of those more critical aspects the real priority. Before we get to the stage where mini golf is a priority, we need to make sure we're addressing our history and conserving the natural resources that we already have. I've, like I said, lived here for over 10 years and living so close to Fernal, the last few weeks have been the first time I've been woken up every morning by construction at 6 a.m. that makes me feel ashamed to live here. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Tammy Lake. I live at 34 Harbor Street in Moncton. Um, I'm going to start out by speaking on behalf of Ben, who is not here. Um, my friend Richard Aldrich, uh, whose parents were both residents at the Fernald, couldn't be here tonight and asked me to just say a couple of things. One, he is asking that relatives, workers, and anyone with close ties to Fernald be able to do a walkthrough or two before any buildings are removed. He has not been able to ever walk through the site where his parents met and lived. Um, they are both passed. Uh, and so that he hasn't been able to get an answer from anyone. He's not a resident of Waltham, but obviously this is a very big thing to him personally. Um, he also, as a descendant of the residents of Fernal, would like uh, conservation of the land with minimal impact to ecology to be prioritized instead of the current plan. Um, now, speaking to myself, um, have any of you ever heard of sensory overload? Because um, I'm neurodivergent. Most of my family is neurodivergent. A lot of my family is also physically stable. But when you are neurodivergent, um, and I, I work with kids, but I'm neurodivergent. So <laughs> this is kind of, if you're building a playground in the middle of mini golf, a train, a train, um, parking, cars, all of that noise is going to cause meltdowns. It's not going to be an enjoyable space for anyone who is neurodivergent. That means autism, ADHD, uh, nonverbal learning disorders. These are things that I think should have been thought through and obviously weren't, or else it wouldn't be in the center of all of this commotion. Um, and when children get to a point where they're, they're having sensory overload, they, uh, it ruins their entire day. They're exhausted afterwards. Um, so just personally, I would, I would ask that um, anyone with experience with children that are neurodivergent, or you know, anyone who is neurodivergent themselves, have they been consulted about this? Has anyone, have they been part of making this plan? Um, if they haven't, why? Why have you been part of this plan? Um, the, only, the only other thing I want to say is that, um, as far as I was taught, disagreement with public plans like this is a normal part of governance. There is no, like, somebody was saying it's like political talks and things like that. Like, there, I've met the mayor. I like the mayor. I know some of you. It's, it's nothing personal. It's just, this is a part of the city. This is a normal part of dealing with new plans in the city. Um, so I hope that we can take that and move forward without it being this, it's an attack kind of mentality. Um, thank you very much for your time. And, uh, Hi, good evening. My name is David Carvelli, 72 Reservoir Road in Waltham. I was born in Waltham. I've lived in Waltham my entire life. Uh, my wife and I currently have four children that are going through the Waltham school system as we speak, so I greatly appreciate all the help and upkeep that the city has done. Um, I'm also a veteran, so I'm kind of partial to that veterans housing that's going up there. I appreciate the thought on that. Um, but what many don't know is that um, I have a child of special needs um, who I think would greatly appreciate uh, having a space for him and his friends to go and play with um, at or along with everybody else. It doesn't really matter. Um, but I had an opportunity to work with many of you on the revitalization of Elsie Turner Park 
Um, I worked with the historic commission. Um, we worked with the. Uh, I apologize. I'm blanking on the name of the water commission. Um, but Waltham Girl Softball played a vital role in that, and I got to see firsthand how much it actually takes to change something like that. And that was just revitalization, not a complete redo. Um, for those of you in the room that don't know, uh, children with special needs at the age of 22 age out of school. So they go to school until the age of 22. Where do they go after that? There's group homes. There's programs for adults afterwards. Learning and listening to everybody in this room tonight about how the firm got its start. Being the very first special education, if you will, I won't use the words that we used back then, um, but they were the very first school in the country to start the change, helping children with special needs learn. I just like to throw out the idea that maybe one of the buildings that you guys are thinking about revitalizing, maybe using that for special needs adults that are over the age of 20. Any time they want to work my son doesn't want to do anything but work he's only 17 so I have five years to go before I have to find something for him to do this would be a great spot for him it would be a great spot for this the, the, the special needs adults that go there maybe for job opportunities to work at those facilities to, to do the things that instead of sitting in a house watching TV all day that they can do I'd be more than happy to speak with any of you. I'm more than willing to help out, and my apologies for not coming to these meetings earlier, um, but I really want to jump in and start helping out wherever I can. I appreciate you guys having the meeting, and the best of luck to you all. Institute that's for disability studies, and they could certainly help. 
um, to uh, as could you know the the um, families and the uh, uh, of um, children uh, with all sorts of, of different uh, you know neurodiversity um, et cetera et cetera um, and those folks themselves and one of the things that I love to see I mean I, the educational part I think is really essential um, there were some good things and there were some really bad things that happened at Fernwood. And those need to be part of, we need to learn from that going forward, celebrate the, the good, and build on that, and, and recognize that and never repeat it. And so I also endorse, you know, making sure that there are no more bodies under the ground in that wonderful land that is the Fernwood. Um, and I also, you know, I also love architecture. And so whatever can be preserved, um, and I worry, you know, I, I didn't come here, as I said, I embarrassed to say I didn't have that. I didn't have knowledge about the, the local government. When I moved here, I moved here because it's an incredibly diverse city. And so I am for the housing, affordable housing, only affordable housing at the firm. Um, and it done in a way that, you know, that is appropriate. And parking, you know, it ha we have to do everything consistently in climate ways. Parking is not, you know, if you cover the surfaces and the water, you know, it's just a mess. Um, you need to do it in a, in a way that um, is uh, most ecologically sound. And don't put the parking lot where, right at the beginning, um, the people in a car can drive to the back of the fernal. There are many park at the front of the fernal. So, I mean, there's just so many things to say. So, I didn't come here disturbed about the local government. But I'm disturbed about the local government at this point um, because of the lack of transparency and the lack of uh, you know analysis and the lack of consultation and the lack of the use of the incredible knowledge that's here. And one of the things I just would like to add to the possible things you could do is um, a book. I just went to a talk at Brandeis last night, but that was um, about NAMI, which is um, uh, uh, you know for people with mental health issues. And there were interviews with people who had mental health issues about what helped them and what didn't in their own words. And before there are no people to talk to about what happened at the Colonel, um, I think that, that it's really important to have a history and that our city should support that and that should be part of, the, of what's shown in whatever museums created there. Um, so I love living here, but I am disturbed about um, some things. Paul Wilbur, 65 Circle Drive, a lifelong Waltham resident. Um, I actually spend a lot of time at the front of the Kildee Queen. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I want to say something that they've done extremely well. The destruction of the cottages and the new uh, the, and rebuilding of the pond that was there and the day lending of the stream was a wonderful job. And most of the people in this room have no idea that happened because they can't go there. It is locked off. Okay, so everybody says, oh, what about the wetlands? They've done a great long job with the wetlands there. And that model should be spread throughout the whole property. We have lots of soccer fields. We have six soccer fields, probably a quarter mile from there, if you go to the woods, which I usually do. We don't need more soccer fields. We have softball fields right down the street. We need natural places for our children to play. To get two generations. Okay. We should have environmental studies there. We should have walking trails. We should look, totally link this property with what I call the next day, because I'm a little bee. And we should also link it with the um, veterans field. So kids who live on Marlboro Road can take their bike and drive to the veterans field through Fernal. Okay? And it should be linked with the uh, community garden, the community farm on the Beaver Street. We should be encouraging walking to this city from one point to another. And this is a property that can link so many uh, of our uh, natural facilities together. But there is, I encourage people to break the law, go down there, and look at the beautiful retention of the new, of the new pond that they put back. And that model should be spread from one end of the front to the other. And I also, uh, the uh, we have, uh, the city has uh, destroyed those buildings through inaction. Uh, so many people said those buildings could have been restored now. 
not a chance now. Because of inaction, because the city's inaction to take proper care of those buildings, they are worthless now. They were very highly valuable at one time, but you guys blew it, okay? For some reason, why you couldn't board them up, why you couldn't have a plan to reuse them, I don't know. And we certainly do need some affordable housing there that can be incorporated in the already developed portions, but I want passive recreation in that we don't have enough of that. We have Prospect Hill, we have the Met State, we don't need more soccer fields, we have plenty of them. We have beautiful Elsie Twitter Park playground there, we have the playground at uh, Warner Field, nice facilities. We need more natural places for our children to play, not more concrete. Thank you very much. Let's do some solar panels. Let's, let's maximize on that. 
Um, and I, I guess just the last thing I just want to mention is somebody asked if any anybody on the Disability Commission or anything that has been consulted, um, excuse me, I don't think anybody who goes up and down to Pell Road didn't, could have avoided seeing the protesters that were out on in the dark when the carnival was there. Um, and those people, many of those people I happen to know, uh, they don't live in Waltham, but they're on a disability commission. Were they incorporated in any of this? Did anybody ask their advice or listen to them? I happen to know for a fact that at least some of the people that were out there and is on a um, highly expected disability commission has met with the mayor and has been disregarded. And, and I think that's just poor. That, that's like, isn't that against the law if you don't listen to the disability commission about you know, making this accessible to everybody? Thank you very much. Hello. My name is Daniel Rundlett, 84 Shirley Road. And I just moved to Waltham uh, in October. We are a butters to the firm. Um, my partner and I had just moved here. We planned to raise a family here. And uh, we were interested in learning more about the firm and what was going to happen. And the only reason we were able to learn about the firm was George Darcy and other individuals who were not part of the city government or city council were in this room, which was somewhat disappointing. And the more we learned about the history of uh, the process and as much as we could gather about what the current plan is, um, we were only disappointed. Uh, we still feel like we don't know uh, what the plan is, and we would love to see a comprehensive master plan. Personally, uh, we and several others are not interested in mini golf and trains. And we'd like the city council to uh, put thought into the employment required, uh, which could be a pro and a or a con, and how that will be addressed along with uh, needs for long term upkeep and maintenance uh, for such types of installations. We would love to see the architecture and ecology um, and the history of the firm um, preserved in a more tasteful way than how it's been presented to this day. And also, um, thoughts on wildlife. Um, we see a lot of wildlife since we moved in um, that travels through the firm and through our neighborhood and how, um, what level of fencing is required around the site and how that will affect the wildlife. And finally, uh, another point that was brought up by so dissatisfied with uh, what I've been able to find out about that uh, so far. And would just like the city to think about and perhaps address that with the residents and how they plan to uh, address any potential issues that may come up in the future, uh, including private roadways, uh, which are in work for and not maintained by the city. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sarah Darling, 29 Health Circle in Beaumont. Even though I'm not a citizen of Waltham, I grew up across from Fernald in the Metropolitan State Hospital. And I have a special connection to Fernald, actually. My brother was a patient there, and my aunt worked there as a nurse. And the stories that she's told me about working there, the things that she saw and experienced, how the patients were treated there, it's despicable. It was horrible. She told me that she had seen staff members abusing, raping nonverbal patients. They couldn't do anything about it. And even when they were reported, Barely anything was done. There are so many other things that happen there, like the Science Club. I'm sure many of you have known about that, where they gave children radioactive oatmeal as an experiment without their consent, and they didn't find out about it until they started getting cancer and other health issues when they were older. And the amount of unmarked graves, we have an opportunity here to do right by these patients. 
we have an opportunity to create history and show the rest of the world what we can do to better things. Personally, I think that it's a great idea to add to the property and to have it open to the public, but I think that trains and golf is disrespectful to the memory and the things that those patients had to experience. I think, and I'm sure everyone here agrees that affordable housing is a very important issue. Can I get a show of hands of who would be for affordable housing here? That's basically everybody in the room. Nobody deserves to be in pain. Nobody deserves to be homeless. We have an opportunity to make a real change in this community, and I feel like you guys have a responsibility to everybody here, every patient, and every staff member to do right and do good things with this property. Thank you. Hello, I'm Meg Silver. I live at 84 Cedar Street in Waltham. I, my husband and I have been Waltham residents for over 30 years here. Um, several points that have already been touched on, but I want to add my voice. History. The buildings are, we can't go back in time to get up the buildings, but we can start now. Get the historical commission involved. When our city councils can be trying to save as many of these buildings as possible, and set up a museum, something to honor the people who are residents of this and the staff who are right there. Mm -hmm. uh, for, I heard that there might be documents around here, so some of these buildings. We cover them. Uh, and we need to put open space. There's a lot of beautiful open space at the road. We should protect the conservation of wetlands, our hill, get the conservation committee involved. Who we see this, these types of beautiful spaces is also other open spaces nearby. Wildlife needs corridors and paths to get from different places to help us be part of our of an open area for our wildlife neighbors in the city. And 500 parking spaces, please. That's a lot. But no public transportation. So how are people who don't drive, maybe live in the south side or other places, supposed to get there? Uh, it means that it's also every playground and recreation area in our city should be accessible. Not just an accessible place at Vernon, but every place around here, because people with disabilities are our neighbors. Good evening, everyone. My name is Eamon Dobbins. I live over at 16A Orange Street. Um, I think this site comes with the confluence of sort of two ways you can tell if someone's involved in it. Because they'll call it like the Fernal. Is it the Fernal? Oh, it's over on Trapello Road. You can always tell when someone isn't quite around here. Um, unfortunately, we refer that a lot because there's been lots of bad press about this. So we see it in Globe articles, we see it on WBZ, when reporters have been talking about the lack of care that has gone into uh, the documents on the property, that has gone into the you know, lack of conservation restrictions, the lack of plan. Uh, and that's upset, you know, to be, to, to live in a city that gets that bad luck, that gets that bad press. Um, I also say that because just like you can tell if someone is in Waltham, depending on how they name all of our landmarks and streets, um, you can also tell if someone isn't doing their job when they make mistakes. Um, I pulled out the current plan uh, from the uh, capital improvement section of the recreation department. And there is a section there that is planned to a memorial. And it says there's a memorial area with historical information. There's seating, flagpole, planting, seat walls, and the braille chart. Now, if this was in Microsoft Word, there would be a little red squiggly underline under the braille. It has two L's and an E at the end. But on the plan that was presented, it says B R I A L, just like the word trail. 
And what that tells me is that the people who designed this, they were not consulting uh, disability communities. They were not consulting <coughs> the neurodivergent communities or those nonprofits. Um, that they are people in an engineering firm that makes playgrounds. They don't make memorial sites for you know, one of the most important institutions for special education. Um, you know, I know there are other rail trails in the area. You go down to Charles, it's near Watertown. But Watertown has one because they also have the Perkins. That's a, a school for the deaf. Rail makes sense there. But when we talk about the front, we need a memorial that is appropriate and fair. And we need one that is made and designed with the consultation of those communities. Um, and, and not from someone who thinks that Brian only has five lives. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Michael Russo. I live at 85 Mallet Way. I'm born and raised in that neighborhood. We have never had a playground, a spray park for the kids in that neighborhood to go to. We've always had to put them in cars, take them to one of the other parks throughout the city. I think it's a great plan to include that area and have a spray park, a playground for the kids to play in, that they don't have to travel by car to go somewhere. And I think with the walking trail and all that, I think this would be a great plan for that area. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Genevieve Tavera, and I live at 158 Marguerite Street, Avenue, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm here as a resident and also as a community organizer at WATCH, and I fight for affordable housing. As a resident, I'm just going to jump uh, to what just happened to me. Uh, I was driving from the airport to my house a couple weeks ago, and a deer ran over me because he couldn't run faster because there was a fence. And all of you know that I'm particularly interested in what you do as our city leaders in the city of Waltham. And I hear about people saying that uh, politicians or ex-politicians are doing something to win the next election. We don't know if that's true or not. But what I know for sure is that I learned about this meeting from an email from an ex-city councillor. So when I hear the word transparency, this is my example. How someone like me that checks the website every day does not find an invitation for this very, very important meeting. Is that called transparency? You know that I'm here because I want to see Fermo to be the bellow for some affordable housing for the people that they cannot afford. The majority of these people that they cannot afford housing are handicapped or have some kind of mental situations. And if you want to find data about who I'm speaking with, you have hospitals with addresses of each of these individuals that I'm talking about. You have the Walton Public Schools with the names and the addresses of the individuals that I'm talking about. Yes, we need affordable housing for all the people with disabilities that live in this city. Please, city councilors, let's do that. You know that you are elected by people. So you are the servants of this community. So let's hear what the community has to say. Let's start doing things for our community, not for our special groups of people. I hear in this meeting that basically no one was asked on what the master plan is. I don't know myself what the master plan they are referring to. 
I think we all have correspondence. You all have my email. I would like to see which master plan do we have for Fermo. Please, I'm here to talk, for, especially with the homeless and the people that they cannot afford an apartment in the city, a safe apartment with their disabilities. Thank you. Judith Hanley. I'm 71 and I've lived my entire life at 115 Parkview Road here in Waltham. And, uh, you know, many of the ideas that have been brought up, I agree with, I somewhat agree with, or don't agree with. But what brought me to this meeting, actually, is uh, the email addressed to Waltham residents from George Darcy. And, um, I, Parkview Road, if you know, don't know it, runs parallel to Waverly Oaks Road. It's a busy, busy traffic corner. You know, like if I'm gonna go to Star Market and Waverly Square, I have to think about what time I go. And I'm retired, who gives a hoot? But I give a hoot, because if I can't get out or I risk being in an auto accident at that point, um, that's disturbing. So in this memo that I received, um, you know, it mentioned that uh, with this MWRA uh, tunnel from Weston, frankly, I think Weston ought to cough up some affordable housing. Um, but at the intersection of Waverly Oaks Road and the Fernald, um, this project which will last for over five years, 100 plus dump trucks um, removing excavated bedrock in that area will be going by. I may never get that gallon of milk again. And um, I, I just, you know, I'm surprised that more people who bought this memo, which somebody very thoughtfully um, stuffed in my mailbox, I, I mean, I'll probably die in this house, you know, but I want to be able to get that gallon of milk without running the risk of being in an auto accident or having my grandchildren be unable to go across the way to Waverly Oaks Park. Thank you all for your, um, for suffering through these meetings, but it's all for a good purpose. Thank you. I'm sorry, but um, 
I yell at kids to get off the roof. I, I ask them if they know that there's a hole on the other part of the roof and I'm afraid they're going to fall in because I'm also a mother and I would hope that somebody would yell at my kids if they were stupid enough to stand on the roof. And if they ever do and they fall in, well, they knew better because I'm their mom. Um, but I really like the idea of a master plan and taking some time to do that. I don't know why it wasn't done. We've been waiting for 10 years. When I found out that the city bought the property, I was thrilled 10 years ago. But for 10 years, I've had people cutting across my yard. There are holes cut in the fence. By the way, any fence, I want people who has had bulldozers behind my house for the past two weeks. They're building a taller fence, but you know, there are bolt cutters up near my house. Someone's just gonna take a cutter and cut to that fence anyway, but that's another topic. Um, the decisions in this city, though, are made kind of slowly. I am a high school parent, so I know that. And while I love the idea of a master plan, and I don't love everything about the current plan, I'm really concerned that a change that are made is it going to take another 10 years. I think we need to do this thoughtfully, beautifully, and really fast at the same time. And I don't know how that can happen, but I just wanted to stress that I don't think if we do the big master plan, a lot of people are asking about, some of us are going to lose our minds if we have to wait another 10 years. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm Amelia McCarthy, uh, or Al uh, McCarthy, uh, 3222 North Clifton Avenue, Chicago, Illinois. Um, I'm a former Waltham resident, and I grew up here, um, and I'm currently a school student. And I was assigned a research project this semester, and I chose this place, Colonel, um, because I knew it was important history, and I thought I knew a lot about it, and I didn't. There is so much history to what we have been discussing tonight, and I know that that's like a little off topic, but not really because the point I want to make is that this education, this, this needs to be taught to people. Like, we need to be preserving this history properly and emphasizing this history properly so that nobody forgets because what, what the city has been doing is the erasure of history, and that's not okay. And I think that we need to be amplifying the voices of the disability community and disabled people when we are having these conversations and when we are considering what we are going to put on this land because like, like there's there's no there's there's no need for disrespect. Like you don't there's a, there's a proper way to memorialize people and I, I may not know what that is, but I don't think it's a labyrinth. Like, from what I am aware of, on the master dock, part of the memorial is a labyrinth, and the, the definition for labyrinth is like a maze that you can't get out of. It's like, why would we, why would we want to memorialize a site with a complex history with a, just like a, a, a memorial that just memorializes confusion. It just memorializes the city's confusion about the topic, and that's not okay at all. We need to, we need to include disabled people in this conversation about what we are doing here, because if we don't, we're bound to make mistakes, and people are bound to forget. And I would also like to emphasize the importance of the Disability Museum that was designed by Alex Green's class in, by, in Alex Green's class at Gann Academy in 2018. A class of 35 students. 35 students. There's, there's more than 35 people in this room. And it took the kids a year. If all the people with all this knowledge pulled together, we could, we could, we could plan, and we don't want to do this super fast because when you do things super fast, there's not a lot of care put in. But there's enough knowledge in this room for us to like actually like call attention to a another memorial. Um, uh, 
this is a, an abstract that I got from one of my classes at school um, for a talk that's actually happening at my school um, in the Department of Art History on Monday, April 1st, and I'm going to read the whole thing. Um, abstract Geographies of Madness, Performance Art as Crip Cartographic Practice. Alexis Riley, she they. All across North America, thousands upon thousands of formerly incarcerated patients lie buried in state hospital cemeteries their graves unmarked, names unknown, and remains unclaimed. While alarming, these conditions are no accident. Rather, they are a strategic enactment of ongoing violence designed to eradicate disabled people and their histories. How might arts practices counter this violence as it manifests in our communities? Ge geographies of Madness, performance art as crypt cartographic practice, responds to this question by taking up performance as both a theoretical lens and creative practice. I first considered the Oregon State Hospital Memorial, the Oregon State Hospital Memorial, a public art installation designed by Annie Hahn and Daniel Mialajo Mihalo of Lead Pencil Studio to house 3,447 unclaimed remains of formerly incarcerated patients. Framing the memorial as a form of durational performance art, I then read the design alongside contemporary mourning and memorialization practices created by psychiatric survivors. Individuals who have experienced medical incarceration often turned into institutionalization, forced treatment, or other forms of state violence in relation to their disability status. Amelia, are you all this time? I do because you're out of time, right? I'm out of time, I'm out of time, that's okay. But thank you for listening to me, and I hope that my words stuck. Thank all the counselors 
and the clerk's department for hosting this event. I am calling for an open and transparent process concerning the redevelopment of the entire 196-acre firm site, including more community meetings concerning any dis decisions made by elected officials. We need a master plan of the entire site that has buy-in from all of the residents of Walton. We should be working with nearby universities to have student teams in landscape architecture and civic design develop plans for Fernald as part of their coursework. Plans then to be shared with the residents of Waltham. Let's find creative and innovative architects that can work with the natural landscape, preserving key features such as the vistas and the mature trees, similar to how H.H. Richardson and Frederick Law Olmsted did as they design the pain and mistake. What would be great for Fernal? Walking paths, a 5K trail connecting the high points of Fernal, extension of the Western Greenway to connect up to the Mass, Mass Central Rail Trail, wildflower fields, farm fields, apple orchards that were there at the Fernal up until 1970. Preserving trees that are over 100 years old, recreational fields, preserving the facades of the four core buildings, repurposing some of the buildings for art galleries and art studios, housing of all different types, affordable senior 55 plus veterans, adults with special needs, a disability museum and innovation center, similar to what was done at Gann Academy, Solar and wind energy facilities, especially on Owl Hill in the southern side, which could power thousands of homes in Waltham. Extension of the MBTA 73 bus along Trapella Road from Waverly Square so that all residents, even those without cars, without licenses, disabled people can access the Fernal site. And finally, a, a private security company to patrol the site and the ability for neighbors to walk the site freely. The only people walking the fernal today are bad actors. Every item that I mentioned above should have ADA accessibility given the history of fernal. A few other ones, interpretive trails, um, and a separated sidewalk and bike path from Alderwood Road down to Marlborough Road that would allow people walking and biking to, to bike safely along Trapella Road. <laughs> the things that I question are the design for parking lots for over 500 cars, when there is no consideration on this plan for the Western Greenway extension allowing people to safely bike to Fernald, cutting down mature strands of trees for roadways, parking lots, and fields. With 196 acres of land, we don't have to clear previously wooded areas. It's almost as if the architect never walked the site, the architect that, that drew up the plans. And, um, and finally, the location of the Universal Playground, and immediately adjacent to busy and noisy Trapella Road, where thousands, tens of thousands of vehicles pass every day, is not appropriate. Finally, um, in summary, this site is one of a lifetime opportunity for any town in Massachusetts. I can picture a future frontal site being a combination of the Arnold Arboretum, Jamaica Pond, Lars Anderson Park, Back Bay Fens, DeCordover Sculpture Park, and the Mount Auburn Cemetery. Let's think outside the box, develop a master plan, working with professionals blending the natural environment with its historic importance that all Waltham residents can then embrace. The historic Fernal site is sacred and its redevelopment is bigger than any one person. Thank you.
instructing the clerk to forward all minutes, correspondence, and logs to the committee to hold for their deliberation. Council of Cobb moves to adjourn the meeting. Thank you.